let me just thank you for for this opportunity and um, for the opportunity to get to know each other and have some fellowship. We just pray, Lord, that um, that you are in control of everything that's said and done, um, that it is your word that is spoken forth um, that is remembered. And we ask you, Lord, that every person here will be in something from what is said and that will take something away from this this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we have two kingdoms on, on earth. Colossians 1. Next week, Jesus, Lord, have your Bibles with you. Thank you. So, yes. And we can look up these yes. scriptures. And it's Colossians 1, verse 13. Most of the scriptures that you will see that are up will be from the King James. Some of them will be from the Amplified. I have not been diligent enough to mark them all, uh, which was the plan. This one is from the King James. Uh, but um, you'll generally know the, the Amplified one will normally have quite a lot of things in brackets because the King James uh, doesn't really explain anything. It just says it. The Amplified says, okay, that's kind of not that clear, so we'll put in brackets what, what parts will help you understand it a wee bit better. So 1 verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That identifies in this verse the two kingdoms. We have here the first kingdom, which is in darkness. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. So kingdom one is the kingdom of darkness. And kingdom two is the kingdom of light. We actually <coughs> have two verses. We have to look at verse 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. What inheritance? We sort of read through these things and we don't really take up them these words, what inheritance? Is it for now? Is it for eternity? Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? Does our life reflect this deliverance? If not, why not? If we've been set free by Jesus Christ, why is it not visible in our lives? These are questions that we're going to be looking at and we're going to be looking at how we answer them. <coughs> and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. What does that really mean? Because we read through these things and when, when, when it sort of isn't that clear, we kind of just move on. So, what are the distinctions between these two kingdoms? These are all questions that need to be answered by a Christian. Every Christian should know this and know the answers to it. The biggest dilemma in life, the ultimate decision. Every Christian is aware that the biggest decision in any person's life is making Jesus Christ their Lord and Saviour. But most, most of us don't actually really know how to communicate this truth to others and we tend to get tied up in awkward questions. So often a Christian will get tied up in things that they know they're saved, they know something's happened on the inside of them and they understand that <coughs> but they don't really understand what took place, they don't understand the background to it and they don't know how to uh, convey this to other people that aren't saved. They just know something's happened, they know they're different, they know it's real, they just don't really know how to transfer that to others, it, it just is, you know, they've only kind of, it's, it's kind of like the what we say in Northern Ireland, just because, you know? And we need to have an answer for the hope that's within us, the Bible says. So, the decision, which master shall I serve? The day that you got born again, you changed masters. That's what happened. So it's the decision, which master will I serve? On that day, everybody asked themselves that question. Maybe not in those words, but that's what you said. Will I serve Jesus Christ? And when you made that choice and said, actually, I will, then you chose to serve Jesus Christ and you switched kingdoms. That's what happened that day. You were translated into the kingdom. The second question 
is which kingdom will I walk in? See, that requires effort. Walking in the right kingdom requires effort. So it's quite easy to be quite blasé and remain in the world and just go to church on a Sunday morning and, and just continue to do certain things. We have to make the decision about whether or not we are going to walk the walk that was just of the of the life we just entered into. <clears throat> the choice is will I walk the ways of the Christian life? Or will I walk in the carnality of the world? If you read through the book of Corinthians, it highlights the carnal Christian. It is the life of the carnal Christian, really. A lifestyle that is ungodly, basically. And to make Jesus our Lord is a different matter. Do we know what the difference is between making him our Lord and making him our Saviour? When we get born again, that day you made him your Saviour. Coming to this course shows that you plan to make him your Lord. That's the distinction. Your saviour is kind of uh, people who want their ticket to heaven. They want to get saved but can't really be bothered to do anything beyond <coughs> making sure that they're going to heaven. So they'll be sort of like a token Christian, a Sunday morning Christian. Whereas making him your Lord is a choice <coughs> to reverence him. It is a choice to venerate him and esteem him. It is an active choice to put him first in every area of our life. We choose daily whether he is our Lord or merely, merely our Saviour. Every day we get an opportunity to make him Lord over that decision or to disobey him, to walk in disobedience. Then when we walk in disobedience, we wonder why certain things happen in our lives. So this is the choice that we have. So how do we know? There's questions that we can ask ourselves to measure this question. Whether he's our Lord or whether he's just our Saviour. Is Jesus my Lord or is he just my Saviour? First thing that we need to know is, do I know the difference? Do I understand the distinctions between the truth? Okay. You don't say no. If you watch any programme, they come running, scurrying up. Yes, Master. Yes. Do we acknowledge his kingship? Or do we try to be his buddy? Because sometimes the teaching has got a little bit muddied in that area. And the reverence for God has been taken out. And people are trying to just say, yeah, yeah, yeah well, he's, he's my best friend. And that is true. Those statements are true. But that doesn't mean that he still isn't God. He is God and he is Lord. And we need to acknowledge that in our lives. How will this affect the decisions that I make in my everyday life? Every time we are faced with a dilemma, every time we are faced with a challenge, we choose whether or not we make him Lord of that part of our lives or not. Is my life full of good intentions, but not much substance? Sometimes you see people that will wander around and they're sort of the, you know, hallelujah brigade who will do things, but you can also see them down in the pub raking about with their mates. And they don't reflect the godly life of a Christian. They don't reflect somebody who's walking in righteousness and true holiness. <clears throat> How much do I hate sin? Am I willing to laugh with my mates when other people sin? Am I willing to still laugh at dirty jokes? Do I still mock? The things that other people mock. How much do I hate sin? How willing am I to compromise with the world? How often do I compromise with the world? Or will I make a stand for Christ? Am I willing to be obedient when it hurts? The Bible does not always say what we want to say. It is not full of niceties. It tells us to do things we don't like. It says that we are not to say nasty things about our enemies. It says pray for those.
pray for your enemies. Bless those that despitefully persecute you. Pray for them. Bless them. That's dead easy, isn't it? Not. It's just about the hardest thing in the world when somebody has actively done something extremely nasty on you. I could bless them. That's not usually the first thing that comes out of your mouth. <laughs> sure it's not. Not really. But you're actually going to see that there's a very good reason why we're told to do this. And it involves being under a law. <coughs> not the law. We are not legalists. We have been set free from the law. But we're going to look at laws shortly. Maybe not tonight, I don't think. Maybe tonight. Well, that's what we're actually going to look at. Because these are spiritual laws and they operate just the same as natural laws. So, is the word of God my standard? Is it the final authority for every decision of my life? These are pretty sobering questions, really, because most of us would have difficulty answering yes to them all. Most of us <coughs> would struggle to say yes, absolutely. And does it really impact my life? And if so, how? How does answering these questions impact your life? Now, next week you're going to have this uh, this book, and all those things are going to be in it. And you're going to have an, uh, a... Satan still has an issue around your neck if you're far enough. Although... Christian has citizenship rights, he cannot avail of the benefits of that citizenship because he has placed himself under the dominion of Satan by his own choices and by his own actions. Every time we dig our heels in in stubbornness and rebellion to God, we have yielded to Satan. Every time. Not just on the times when we are not right, because we always think we're right when we dig our heels in. That's why we dig our heels in. Because we think we're right. So, Galatians 5.1 Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What that's saying is that's an action. It's a choice. Stand fast in the liberty. It says, Christ has set you free. Don't waste it. That's what he says, don't waste it. <coughs> don't be stupid enough to return back and get all tied up in knots with the stupid lifestyle that has set you free from. If we're honest here, most of us didn't get saved until something catastrophic in our lives happened. Until something happened that made you think, what have I done? I have wasted so many opportunities, so much of my life. I have... You know, these things have happened and you suddenly realise, do you know what? I've made a mistake. At that point in time, when you realise that you've made a total mess of your life, you take your broken life that's in a thousand pieces, an absolute mess, something that nobody wants because it's an absolute mess, and you lift <coughs> it and you cart it over and you say, you hear God, thanks, because <laughs> that's a mess. And, you know, you said you were willing to take it, there you go. And we throw our life at Christ because it's in absolute pieces. All these things have gone wrong and I mean, those that have got saved when they were very young won't have necessarily made all those mistakes. But for a lot of us, they did make a lot of mistakes and you do that. And so you're happy because you can't do anything about that mess because the reason you gave it to Christ was because you got to the end where you could do nothing. So you're quite happy to say, you know what, <laughs> nobody can fix it. I'll give it to you anyway. So then, Christ being the potter, he says, okay, let's start to rebuild it. He starts to rebuild it, and he gives you all these different benefits and these bonuses. Start to rebuild your life, and maybe things that, have, that were missing in your life, he has brought them back in and restored them, and, you know, people have got houses and jobs and all sorts of things, so you rebuild your life up. So now you've got something fairly decent. Not exactly what you want, but fairly decent. Thing. Thanks, I'll take it back now. We couldn't fix it when it was a mess. And we think that we're going to do a better job than God when it's half fixed. <coughs> Sometimes we are really quite brain dead when we think about what we do. 
That's just called independence, but we'll come to that later on in the course. And that's a biggie too, because we really like our independence. So, again we have Colossians 1.13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness. And John 8.32, and ye, know, ye shall know the truth, and the truth, the truth that ye know shall set you free. The truth's the truth. It doesn't make any difference. That Bible, the truth is the truth, whether you believe it or not. But it's the truth that you know, it's the truth that's written on the tablets of your heart. It's the truth that's, that's the core of your very being that will set you free. It doesn't set you free when it's on page. You haven't got ownership of it when it's on page. It's only when it's on the inside of you that it's set you free. Romans 6, if you want to turn to that. Get used to navigating your Bibles. <laughs> Romans 6, it's just after the Gospels, oh, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And then you've got Acts. Romans 6, 12. So let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it. So what it says here is, that's a choice. Don't obey the lusts of the flesh. When you have this stubbornness rising up in, in the inside of you, when you have this rebellion rising up in the inside of you, when you have unforgiveness rising up in the inside of you, when you have an offence rising up in the inside of you, he says, don't let it take charge. Don't let it reign. Don't obey it. Don't. He says, don't. That's, that's not going to be productive in your life. So, our choice Everything we do involves choice, either to follow God or Satan. Every choice. When we obey those things, we're following Satan. We have a choice in everything. It is one choice. <laughs> it is obey God or disobey God. That's it. That's your choice. Every decision that we make is a choice to either obey God or to disobey God. Doesn't matter what it is, that's your choice. When something happens, your decision is either in obedience to God or in disobedience. Every decision. The thing is that if we make the Word of God our absolute authority, then that gives God the freedom to work in our lives. When we choose contrary to God's way, we weaken his ability to work in our lives. You see, we must be in his kingdom for him to work in our lives. He is not coming into Satan's kingdom. <coughs> he is absolutely not coming into Satan's kingdom after you. What he says is, I'm still here where I'm supposed to be, and I'm willing to help you when you turn from your rebellious ways. As soon as you make the right choice, then I'm still here. You're not coming to where you're at. I'm here for you. Choose righteousness. And when we finished with our rebellious ways, then we can turn back to him and say, done my way, didn't work. Okay, let's do it your way. He says, okay, let's do it my way now. That's pretty much how it goes. And sometimes we look at the, the wilderness wanderings for um, all those years that you'd have been on an 11-day journey. And you think, how stupid can you be? But we do, it the same, we do exactly the same thing. We do exactly the same thing. We just call it by a different name. When somebody says, not doing that, and you think, I'll do it my way. And you see, as soon as you say, I will do it my way, that indicates that you're walking in Satan's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say, my will be done. He said, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Not mine, thine. And when we put the word I and my in it, 
we have instantly negated God's ability to work in our life. We can simply, simply not going to happen. Because you, you have decreed. And you see, God is sovereign in certain things. And man is sovereign. God gave man free will to choose what he likes. He even gave him free will to choose to go all the way to hell. And he won't interfere with it. So man has got free will. So when we say, I won't... And that's the first thing. See when we look at our own kids. As soon as they come in, I won't do that. And you think, right, I should knock that out of you. I should change your mind about that. But we know exactly what we do. We're made in this image and likeness, and that's what he thinks too. So he does. So, understanding this division. This, we'll cover this actually next week because we're kind of... Um, more or less finished our time. Um, we'll just give a brief in introduction to it, but we will look at it more deeply next week, but it'll be a bit of an introduction. Most people don't really understand our salvation, and it has led to all sorts of errors in doctrine and teaching. <clears throat> and then people think, I'm a saved, I'm a not saved, what's happened, and you know, all sorts of things. So we're going to look at the reality of what actually took place. And salvation has three tenses to it. Okay, so there's three aspects to our salvation. The first aspect is our justification. And our justification is a past tense event for every person here. Our justification was something that happened at the new birth. And the sort of the wee cliche that goes along with that, most people will have heard, is just as if I hadn't sinned, which is a wee sort of thing that people remember it by. That justification is when we were justified before Christ made so that he could look at us just as if I hadn't sinned. That's how people remember. And so that's the, that was the place, and that was our new birth experience. And the second thing is sanctification. And that is present tense, and that is ongoing. That will continue from now until the day that our body ceases to function at this level on this earth. And the third one is glorification, and that's future, and that's our eternal state. We're really not going to touch on that. We'll give you a couple of scriptures to <clears throat> just to identify those three tenses, but we're not going to touch on that because it's really just there in the future. It's just simply something that we can know about and don't really do very much about. So the justification part is actually the work and responsibility of the Holy Spirit. We do nothing. All we have done before we got justified was accept the message that we needed a saviour. And then we asked God to be our saviour. And so his response is that work in us. And that is the work that he um, has placed in us. Um, second, that one is Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden him. By whom you were sealed. Marked, branded as God's own, secure for the day of redemption, of final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. That is um, indicates to us that at the new birth, God sealed us. He sealed our spirit, basically because if he didn't, then we would have contaminated by our own actions. So it was sealed, it was made perfect, and unless he zapped us all dead at that point in time, we would have lost our salvation within five minutes because we would have sinned. And if you're really lucky, probably an hour. So he sealed our spirit so that it was ready and, and secure and remains in that justified state. But he didn't do that to our bodies or our souls. Which is a bit unfortunate because that means that the next part is our responsibility primarily. So whilst he works with us as a co-worker, the main part of the second aspect of sanctification is the responsibility of the individual that is to renew the mind and make the necessary changes and adjustments that our mind is going to line up with the word of god and that's where we have to make those necessary adjustments see when we get saved we've made the decision we're in the world over here and we have said okay jesus is over here and we, we have chosen jesus and so we get saved but the body and the mind only have 
the operating system of the world. So he gives us this manual and he says, these are the things, these are the adjustments you need to make to your mind so that you can operate in the mind of Christ that I've given you. And so that's what he has given us. 2 Timothy 2 says, So whoever cleanses himself from what is unclean, who separates himself from contact with contaminating and corrupting influences, will then himself be a vessel set apart and useful for honourable and noble purposes, consecrated and profitable to the Master, fit and ready for every and any good work. So what it says there is that we make ourselves a suitable vessel for the Master's use. It's his desire that we all change, but it's our responsibility. And glorification, which is the, the future tense of what goes on, is the work and responsibility of God. First John 3 2 <coughs> says, Beloved, now we now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. When he's revealed, we be like him. And we get a wee, wee glimpse of the, the time after the resurrection when his body could do things that none of ours can do right at this point in time. So we're going to look at each one of those individually uh, next week. And that's just the introduction of where we're going with next week's. And next week, uh, when, when we're finished covering that part, we're actually going to start into the spiritual laws that govern the two kingdoms because we have two laws in operation in our lives. And we're going to look at those two specific laws and how they affect and impact our lives on a daily basis. And how they are an actual law and what rules apply to a law. We're going to compare it to the likes of gravity and electricity and how those things are a constant and they're predictable. Because a law is a rule whereby when a specified set of conditions are met, it produces the same results every time. So that's what lies ahead for next week anyway. So we'll just, we'll just go over the word.